1994, what a year. Next year is the 30th anniversary, you know. For those of you too young to remember this glorious interval of human history, let me hit some of the highlights so you know what you missed and can feel an appropriate level of Romo. That's regret over having missed out. Nelson Mandela was elected president of South Africa. George Foreman won the world heavyweight title at age 45, becoming the oldest world heavyweight champion in the history of boxing. They had the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway, where the world was glued to the figure skating competition thanks to the drama surrounding Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. Netscape Navigator was released, introducing the World Wide Web, the internet as we know it today, to millions of people. Pulp Fiction, The Shawshank Redemption, Clerks, and Hoop Dreams opened in theaters. Uh, you want to talk music? Johnny Cash released American Recordings, The Offspring released Smash, Beck released three albums, one of which was Mellow Gold, his commercial breakthrough, Nas, Notorious B.I.G., Coolio, Outkast, and The Fugees all released their debut albums, Comics, Cyclops and Jean Grey got married, and Dick Tracy and Tess Trueheart got divorced. Actually, that last one doesn't sound as upbeat as the others, does it? No worries. Other stuff happened in comics in 1994. What about Spider-Man? The Clone Saga began. That was... You know, now that I think about it, 1994 was also the year of City Slickers 2 and Exit to Eden and that really crappy remake of The Getaway with Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger, and Kurt Cobain died, and Republicans won majorities of both houses of Congress in the midterm elections. Maybe it wasn't such a great year after all. What about Star Trek, though? Huh? That's what I'm here to talk about anyway, right? And 1994 was sure enough a good year for Star Trek. Deep Space Nine completed its excellent second season and began its also excellent third season. TNG finished up its run with All Good Things, one of the best series finales in the history of television, and then made its highly anticipated jump to the big screen with... No. Oh, God. No, 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 no! What should Star Trek Generations actually have been? I apologize for all that just now. I'm okay, really. And I know some of you might be confused by that reaction, because you like Star Trek Generations, so let me explain. I don't. Some others among you might be confused because while you wouldn't call Generations one of your favorite movies or anything, you also don't consider it particularly bad. You find it unremarkable, but, you know, fine. So let me explain that too. I don't. It's not the worst of the TNG movies, that would be Nemesis, nor is it the worst of the Star Trek movies overall, that would be Nemesis. But Generations is still pretty bad. It's pitched as an epic crossover between two eras of the franchise, but the crossover turns out to be a prologue featuring Captain Kirk, and then Kirk returning for a few scenes near the end before getting killed off. The plot feels like it was constructed out of spare parts the producers of TNG had lying around the office. Data's a motion chip, crashing the Enterprise, Geordi getting kidnapped and tortured. Again. And what the hell, let's throw Lursa and Bator in there too. Why not? Plus, the production design is in this awkward transitional phase between TV and movie. The whole thing comes across as half-hearted and slapped together. It could have been so much more. One way or the other, it should have been so much more. And I say one way or the other because I think... There are two ways that Generations could have gone, other than the direction it actually went, that might have resulted in a significantly better movie than the one we got. But before I get there, let's take a quick look at the movie we got and identify some of the main problems. The movie opens with a prologue depicting the launch of a brand new Starship Enterprise, the Enterprise B. The one that comes right after the Enterprise A, the ship Captain Kirk and his crew flew into the sunset or literally just the sun, I guess, at the end of the previous film, Star Trek VI. This is a nice idea, in theory. It begins the film on a note of transition, a changing of the guard. Captain Kirk himself is on hand for the ceremonial first cruise of the Enterprise B, flanked by two members of his old crew, Scotty and Chekhov, chosen because their actors were the ones who said yes after Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly said no. 
This is the first problem that reveals itself, and it's not a good sign that it shows up this early. It's obvious that Scotty and Chekhov were originally intended to be Spock and McCoy. And when the producers realized Spock and McCoy were no longer an option, they swapped in Scotty and Chekhov and altered the script as minimally as they could while still having things make sense. Leonard Nimoy confirmed this in an interview with TrekMovie.com in 2007, where he explained his decision not to appear in Generations by saying, quote, There were five or six lines attributed to Spock, but it had nothing to do with Spock. They were not Spock-like in any way. I said to Rick Berman, you could distribute these lines to any one of the other characters and it wouldn't make any difference. And that is exactly what he did. That's why Chekhov takes charge of the medical care of the refugees the Enterprise rescues from the ships being destroyed by the Nexus, and Kirk chides Scotty that he would make a lousy psychiatrist. Those bits were clearly meant for McCoy. And why Scotty reacts to Kirk's repeated standing up during dramatic moments with the very Spock-like line, Captain, is there something wrong with your chair? The Enterprise B's maiden voyage doesn't go as planned. The ship runs into the Nexus, a powerful energy ribbon that damages the ship, knocking a chunk of it off. It just so happens Captain Kirk was in that chunk at the time, doing some technobabble stuff so that the ship could break free from the Nexus. So as the prologue ends, it looks like Captain Kirk is dead. Then we dissolve to the Enterprise D, 80 years later, where Kirk would have been dead anyway, where we are introduced or reintroduced, if you've been watching Star Trek The Next Generation for the last seven years, to Captain Picard and his crew. We meet them on the holodeck aboard a 19th century seagoing version of the Enterprise, where they've gathered for a ceremony to promote Security Chief Worf to the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Once again, a good idea in theory. Introducing the TNG crew on an old-fashioned sailing ship, playing with the concepts of past and future, the newer generation of characters on a much older version of the Enterprise. I like it. It gives the impression that the producers of the film really put some thought into creating an interesting and clever introduction for the main characters. It's a shame they didn't put the same level of thought into the rest of the movie. Riker hazes Worf by dunking him in the ocean. Everybody laughs. Data tries to get in on the fun by shoving Dr. Crusher overboard. Nobody laughs. Captain Picard gets a message telling him his entire family is dead. I laugh. What? They're not real. They're not even characters in this movie. Can't I find the deaths of imaginary people arbitrarily hilarious without being looked on as some kind of sicko? Anyway, we don't actually learn about the deaths of Picard's family yet. We just see him receiving what is obviously bad news, and then he's really cranky for a while and nobody knows why. The Enterprise receives a distress call from an observatory that's under attack and flies to the rescue, but by the time they arrive, the battle is over and the attackers are gone. Riker leads an away team, which finds Dr. Sarin and a dead Romulan, thus revealing who was responsible for the attack. We've seen Dr. Sarin before. He was among the refugees taken aboard the Enterprise B in the prologue. So, by the way, was Guinan. But before we get to that, we check in on Data, who as a result of pushing Dr. Crusher into the holographic ocean a little while ago, has come to a life-altering decision. He asks Geordi to install his emotion chip, because he's sick and tired of not getting jokes, and not knowing when it's okay to shove people off of boats and when it's not. So, Geordi unscrews the top of Data's head and plugs in the emotion chip, and now Data has feelings! They visit Ten Forward, where Guinan offers Data a drink, which he hates, much to his delight. Sorin meets with Picard and pushes to be allowed to return to the observatory. He's got an important experiment he needs to check on. Picard tells him to wait until they've completed their investigation of the attack, and Sorin stares him down and says, they say time is the fire in which we burn. Which, when we learn that Picard's brother and nephew died in a fire a few scenes later, turns out to be a really fucked up thing to say. I'm starting to feel like this clearly unbalanced character played by Malcolm McDowell might not be one of the good guys. Geordi and Data are on the observatory investigating some stuff. Soren shows up, turns heel by knocking out Geordi and pointing a phaser at Data, who's like, please don't shoot me, man! I just got emotions! 
Riker and Worf come to the rescue and exchange fire with Sauron, but Sauron takes Geordi and beams away to a Klingon ship commanded by Lursa and Bator that just appeared nearby. Meanwhile, the Armagosa star explodes because Sauron launched a probe into it a few minutes ago, so the Enterprise has to hightail it out of there. Dr. Crusher does some research on Sauron and discovers that he was in the same group of refugees brought aboard the Enterprise B as Guinan. So Picard goes and talks to Guinan, and she tells Picard about the Nexus, the magic energy ribbon that transcends time and space and lets you live out whatever fantasy you want. Sauron's entire family was lost when the Borg invaded their star system, so he probably wants to return to the Nexus so he can hang out with them. Or maybe he started a new family in the Nexus that was better than his old family, and he wants to spend time with that family instead. I don't know. I can only speculate. Picard and Data figure out that Sauron blew up the Armagosa star in order to shift the course of the Nexus as it moves through the galaxy. And if he blows up another particular star, the course of the Nexus will take it right into a planet, Viridian 3. Sauron will no doubt be on that planet, trying to blow up that star so he can get back into the Nexus to see whichever one of his families he misses the most, because he has apparently forgotten that you don't need to blow up stars and alter the course of the Nexus. You can just fly into it with a ship, and it doesn't matter if the Nexus destroys the ship since you end up in the Nexus anyway. It's how Sauron got to the Nexus the first time. But anyway, they know he's going to Viridian 3, so Picard takes the Enterprise there too, so they can stop Sauron from blowing up the star and maybe also get Geordi back. They get to Viridian 3, Sauron is on the planet building a Starkiller rocket, Lursa and Bator are there on their ship, Picard negotiates Geordi's release, but they send Geordi back with a hacked visor that lets them learn the Enterprise's shield frequency. Picard beams down to the planet to talk to Sauron, meanwhile the Klingon ship attacks the Enterprise. Eventually, the Enterprise wins the fight and blows up the Klingon ship, but it's so badly damaged that they have to separate the saucer section and crash land on the planet before the drive section goes kablooey. Picard tries to talk Sauron out of blowing up the star, but that doesn't work, so he tries to fight him, but that doesn't work either, and Sauron launches his rocket and the star blows up, and the planet is pulverized by the shockwave and everybody dies, except Picard and Sauron who are both pulled into the Nexus. We don't see what Sauron experiences in there, but Picard has an old-fashioned family Christmas with an imaginary wife and imaginary kids and even his imaginary not-dead nephew. Something's not right, though. Picard knows this is all false, which is confirmed when Guinan shows up, explaining herself as an echo left behind from when Guinan was in the Nexus before. Guinan tells Picard that time has no meaning in the Nexus, so he can go back and see his children born, or go forward and see his grandchildren, or mix and match and have his great-great-grandparents meet his great-great-grandchildren. Maybe force them to fight, and he can be the referee, whatever Picard wants. Oh, also, Guinan says, because time has no meaning here, if you decide to leave the Nexus, you can go to any time and any place you want. Picard's like, great, so I can go back to a few minutes before I got swept up in the Nexus and stop Soren from blowing up the star and destroying Viridian 3. Right, but remember, you can also go back to any time you want. So now that you know what happens, you could just return to the Enterprise a few days ago and warn Starfleet about what Sauron is doing on that observatory and prevent any of this from happening. If I'm going to stop Sauron from launching that rocket, I'll need some help. So go recruit Captain Kirk. He's here too. And that's just what Captain Picard does. He strolls over to Captain Kirk's house, where he finds Kirk outside chopping wood. From Kirk's point of view, he's only just arrived in the Nexus 2, and he's not really sure what's going on yet. Picard's like, hey, I'm Jean-Luc Picard, and I'm the captain of the Enterprise too. like 80 years after you die. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, there's this guy I want to beat up before he destroys a star, so do you want to leave this eternal paradise where reality bends to your whim and help me punch this guy? Because I tried punching him by myself, but it didn't work. At first, Kirk's like, mm, no, actually, I just figured out that this is my old house that I bought the first time I retired, and my smoking hot ex-girlfriend is waiting for me upstairs, so I'm going to take her breakfast in bed, and then maybe once she's full of starchy, fatty breakfast food, she'll want to have sex. 
But then Kirk and Picard ride some horses, and he changes his mind. So they go back to Viridian 3, and they gang up on Soren, and the duo of Captain Kirk and Captain Picard, the generation-spanning Star Trek dream team, are just barely able to defeat this lone middle-aged scientist. But their victory comes at the cost of Kirk's life. The bridge he's on collapses, and he tumbles down into a rocky canyon. Picard scrambles down to Kirk, tells him they won, they saved the planet, he rigged Soren's rocket to explode, and Soren was standing right there at the controls when it went off. It was pretty sweet. I guess time is the fire in which he burns now. <laughs> oh, you're dying. Kurt gets a smile on his face, chuckles weakly. Picard's like, what's funny, bro? And Kirk's like, I was just thinking about the echo of myself I left behind in the Nexus. I hope he's having a good time fucking my ex-girlfriend. I remember that last time I did it with her. It was... fun. And with those noble last words, Captain Kirk dies. Again, I remind you that from Picard's perspective, Kirk's been dead all along, but, you know. Picard drags Kirk's corpse up to the top of a cliff and buries him under a big pile of rocks. That must have taken all damn day, huh? And then a rescue party arrives and picks him up, and he and Riker pick through the wreckage of the Enterprise's saucer section. Picard finds his family album, and he and Riker have a nice exchange about the passage of time and how it gives life meaning. And then they beam away, saying goodbye to the Enterprise D forever. Or at least until it's resurrected 29 years later in a shameless and cynical act of fan service once Paramount realizes what a massive buck there is in making sentimental, overly attached Trekkies cry. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this rotten ass movie, Star Trek Generations, which is now over. So, like I said before the recap, as I see it, there are two options for ways in which this could have gone, either of which might have been better than the movie we ultimately got. And I want to stress might, because, as I always say when I do videos like this, where I pitch belated fantasy rewrites of movies or TV shows, this is just a thought experiment. It's ludicrous to try and seriously compare a real movie that real people really made to an idea for a movie that exists only in my imagination. I'm not saying my ideas would have been better than the movie they actually made. I don't know that. I can't know that. That's not the point. The point is to identify ways in which I think Star Trek Generations fails or goes wrong and propose changes that might have improved it. Think of the rewrites I'm about to pitch you as echoes of the movie you know. Variations that don't actually exist, but might have existed. Option number one, do a proper, full-on classic Trek and next-gen crossover. Both crews, both ships. This was the original concept for the movie, or one of the original concepts, at least, when Paramount approached Rick Berman about doing TNG movies after the TV series ended and making the first one a crossover with the classic Trek characters, Berman commissioned multiple scripts. The writing team of Ronald D. Moore and Brannon Braga, who did ultimately write the movie, started with the obvious idea of featuring both crews, but they couldn't quite figure that out. So they altered their original concept to something much closer to what we got, a prologue featuring the characters from Star Trek the original series, with the TNG characters taking over for most of the movie, and then Captain Kirk coming back in the last act to team up with Captain Picard. Then the prologue was altered to include only Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, rather than the entire original crew. And finally, when Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly declined to appear, the prologue was slightly rewritten one more time, and we got Kirk, Scotty, and Chekhov as the classic Trek representation. But throughout most of the development process, the concept for Generations consisted of classic Trek characters essentially functioning as guest stars in a TNG movie. I'm saying, why not make a proper TOS and TNG crossover movie? There are all kinds of reasons why not. The studio didn't want to spend the money, some of the actors didn't want to do it, but this is just a thought experiment, remember? So, assuming the studio was committed to funding the project and assuming all the actors were on board, how might this version of Generations have worked story-wise. At first glance, the obvious entry point is sometime shortly after the conclusion of Star Trek VI. The Enterprise A, commanded by Captain Kirk, is on its way home to Earth to be decommissioned when something unexpected happens and the classic crew is pulled into an adventure that 
eventually leads them to encounter the Enterprise D and Captain Picard's crew. But there's a problem with this. If we pick up directly following Star Trek VI, Sulu is not on the Enterprise. He's captain of the Excelsior. We need to get Sulu back aboard the Enterprise when the shit goes down. There are all sorts of ways we could do this. Here's one idea. Before we pick things up with Kirk and the gang on the Enterprise, we get a brief prologue to introduce the villain. It can still be Dr. Soren. His motivations and goals will just be slightly different. But for this first scene, we just need to establish him as a mysterious and dangerous guy on a Klingon ship, and the ship is flying into the Nexus. We'll keep that too, but we don't explain what it is yet. The ship is being overtaken by the Nexus, and the Klingons aren't too sure about this, but Sauron seems totally confident, almost blissful, like a guy who knows what he's doing, where he is, and where he's going. And the ship is bathed in light and vanishes. Opening credits fade in on the Enterprise A. Now here's how we get Sulu back. The Enterprise and the Excelsior both stop at a starbase shortly after the events of Star Trek VI. The Enterprise, for some repairs necessary to make it home following the battle with General Chang, the Excelsior, because Captain Sulu and his crew have been given orders from Starfleet for another long-range exploratory mission, and they need to refuel and resupply. They weren't expecting to see each other again so soon after their big goodbye, so when Sulu runs into Kirk on the Starbase, he makes a we-have-to-stop-meeting-like-this joke or something. Kirk tells Sulu that he and the senior officers on the Enterprise are having a farewell dinner, their last meal together on the ship before they mothball her, and since Sulu is here, he should come too. The Excelsior isn't due to embark on its new mission until the next day, so Sulu gratefully accepts. He just needs to get something from his cabin on the Excelsior. Since they're right near where the Excelsior is docked, Kirk tags along. As they walk through the corridors of the Excelsior, Kirk remarks on how empty it is. And Sulu tells him most of his people are on the station, taking some R&R. So there's only a skeleton crew aboard at the moment. Sulu goes to his cabin, gets a bottle of wine he's been saving for a special occasion, and he and Kirk head over to the Enterprise. Kirk arrives back on the bridge with Sulu, Spock, and Chekhov, and Uhura are there, and they greet Sulu, and then... The starbase comes under attack. Torpedoes, explosions, nobody knows who's shooting or why, but the attack seems centered on the Excelsior. Sulu hails a ship to tell someone to get it out of there immediately, but it's no use. The Excelsior is destroyed in a matter of moments. The Enterprise, the only other starship at the base, takes heavy fire from the attacker as well, but manages to undock and get out of the way of a massive torpedo barrage that would have finished it. The starbase is severely damaged, but not destroyed. With everyone scrambling to figure out what happened, Spock detects some unusual readings nearby. Time distortions. And, judging from the angles at which the torpedoes came at the Excelsior and the Starbase, it's likely the attacks originated from the direction of those time distortions. Kirk says to go check it out, and what they find when they get close enough is the Nexus, a ribbon of energy just passing through nearby space. Spock detects the faint traces of a ship inside the ribbon, a Klingon ship and the weapons used to destroy the Excelsior and the Starbase were similar to Klingon disruptors. Kirk gives the order to follow that ship into the Nexus. The Enterprise goes in, is bathed in that same light we saw at the beginning, and we transition to the 24th century and introduce the Enterprise D and Captain Picard and crew. We get a captain's log from Picard explaining that the Enterprise has taken a detour from its mission to the wherever sector to do whatever in order to study an unusual phenomenon passing through this region of space. And the unusual phenomenon is the Nexus. As they're studying it, Data or Worf or somebody picks up a Klingon ship rapidly approaching the Nexus. Picard hails the ship to see what it intends to do, but the ship responds by firing on the Enterprise. A brief battle ensues, which ends with the Klingon ship flying into the Nexus. Then they pick up another reading. There's a second ship inside the energy ribbon, a Starfleet ship, and its shields are failing. Data estimates that the Enterprise's shields should be strong enough to withstand the interior of the ribbon, so Picard orders the Enterprise in to find and rescue that other ship. 
The other ship is, of course, Kirk's Enterprise. Because of all the interference and chaos inside the Nexus, Kirk mistakes Picard's Enterprise for the ship they were chasing and opens fire. Picard's Enterprise is damaged by the surprise attack, but things settle down before either ship is destroyed. However, the impulse engines of both ships are now offline, so neither Enterprise can escape the Nexus. The two Enterprises are close enough to each other that they can communicate through the view screen. Kirk doesn't recognize Picard, naturally, but Picard knows who Kirk is and immediately grasps the gravity of the situation. Picard suggests to Kirk that they meet in person for a discussion, and Picard says under the circumstances it would be better for him to visit Kirk's Enterprise. Picard doesn't want to risk altering the timeline by bringing people from Kirk's Enterprise to the Enterprise-D and having them learn information about their futures. Data says it's impossible to use the transporter inside the energy ribbon, what with all the interference and such, but if the Enterprise-D extends its shields around the Enterprise-A, they should be able to take a shuttlecraft from one ship to the other safely. So that's what they do. Picard and Data fly a shuttle over to the Enterprise A, and that's how Captain Kirk meets Captain Picard. So from this point on, I don't have a lot of details. Not that what I've told you already wouldn't also need a lot of work before it got to the shootable stage, because it would. I haven't had time to break down a complete plot for this imaginary movie, but I do have some more ideas that I would want to include if possible. The two Enterprises need to get out of the Nexus before the forces inside of it overwhelm their shields and destroy them. That's their first problem. Then, they need to fend off further attacks from Soren and figure out what his evil plan is and stop him from carrying it out. We need to get back to Soren as the villain eventually and reveal that his intention in destroying the Excelsior was to kill Kirk. He used the Nexus to travel back in time to a point in the past when he thought he could be sure of Kirk's exact whereabouts, only he got the timing off by just a few minutes so that when he destroyed the Excelsior, Kirk and Sulu had already left. He fired on the Enterprise as well for good measure, but the Enterprise managed to evade the worst of it. This version of the Nexus is different from the one in the actual movie. This Nexus bridges time periods across specific points of space. You can use the Nexus to travel to the past and the future, but you always emerge at the point in the past or the future where the Nexus is at that time. The Nexus was passing by the Starbase, where the Enterprise-A and the Excelsior were parked at that time, so that's when Soren chose to make his attack. Also, when Picard's Enterprise fought Soren's ship before it flew into the Nexus, that was Soren flying into the Nexus to go back and blow up the Excelsior, which we already saw. The good guys figure all of this out eventually. We see Soren again when he emerges from the Nexus after the Excelsior attack, and that's when our heroes can go after him. Why does Soren want to kill Kirk? I don't know exactly, but I know I want it to turn out to be a paradox. In other words, Soren wants to kill Kirk for something Kirk is going to do in his future, something that results in tragic consequences for Soren, but it turns out Soren himself, through his time traveling to stop Kirk, is actually responsible for the thing he's trying to prevent. I think that's a nice twist that would really add something to the plot, but I don't have specifics. I also want Picard to tell Kirk during their first in-person conversation that history doesn't record his Enterprise disappearing or being destroyed, which eventually leads to the epiphany that Kirk and his Enterprise are destined to return to their own time, which means between now and then, Kirk and his crew are basically invincible. Every choice they make is the choice they were destined to make, and no matter what, they're going to make it home. Obviously, I don't want them to have this epiphany until very late in the film, otherwise it kills every drop of suspense, but I think it could make a really cool late beat for Kirk, as he realizes with triumphant confidence that this time he can't lose. Since this is a crossover movie, I also want at least one or two moments between various groupings of characters. Eventually, the urgency of the situation will compel Picard and Kirk to set their concerns about the timeline aside, and both crews will begin to intermingle on both ships in order to get the job done. So, in addition to Picard and Kirk stuff, we need some shared business for Data and Spock, 
different business from what they had when Spock guest starred on TNG, obviously. In fact, other than perhaps a vague illusion, we won't even mention that here. Because this version of Spock should know about that anyway, since it's still in his future. We need some scenes with Dr. Crusher and Dr. McCoy, Geordi and Scotty, again, unique from their interaction in Relics, which is at most alluded to, but not directly referenced or discussed, Worf and Chekhov. Chekhov has been kind of sort of the security officer for his enterprise throughout the TOS movie series. Plus, Worf's adopted parents are Russian, so they've got Russia stuff in common. Troy and Uhura, and this might also be an opportunity to bring Guinan in as well, which I'm sure would have been a thrill for Whoopi, knowing what the character of Uhura and Nichelle Nichols meant to her. And that just leaves Riker and Sulu who would make a good pairing in this story because Riker is the longtime first officer who still hopes to be the captain of the Enterprise someday, and Sulu is the former longtime Enterprise officer who finally got promoted to captain of his own ship and just saw that ship destroyed. Speaking of destroying ships, I do think we should keep the destruction of the Enterprise D. It can be lost in the final showdown with Sauron somehow, maybe sacrificed as part of a plan to defeat Sauron, so the crew knows ahead of time that they're going to lose the ship, and they evacuate via shuttlecraft and escape pods before it self-destructs or whatever happens. That way, we have a chance for there to be a scene involving the entirety of both casts, but featuring Kirk, Sulu, Picard, and Riker, where Kirk, who knows something about losing a ship, takes a moment to comfort Sulu, who lost the Excelsior, and Picard, and his crew, who are about to lose their Enterprise, by telling them that when he, Kirk, lost the original Enterprise, he grieved, but he looked around at the people he was with and realized that he hadn't been captain of a ship, he'd been captain of a crew. The people he'd served on the ship with were who mattered the most. And the Enterprise D explodes, and Soren is defeated, and Kirk and his people say farewell to the 24th century and return through the Nexus to their own time. They emerge from the Nexus a short while after the attack on the Starbase and the Excelsior. Uhura reports that they are receiving distress calls from survivors aboard the base, and Kirk looks to his crew and says, Well, it looks like our work isn't quite done yet. And we leave them as they prepare to offer assistance to the Starbase. We transition back to the 24th century, sometime later, as Picard and the crew of the Enterprise D have been picked up and find themselves on another ship. If we want to get cute with it, we can have it be a successor of the Excelsior, the Excelsior B or C or something. Picard is in his guest cabin when Riker drops in. Picard's been drinking some wine and he offers Riker a glass. Picard has been looking up the service records of the Enterprise A crew. We catch a glimpse of Sulu's record, which shows that he went on to become the captain of another ship after the destruction of his Excelsior. Not another Excelsior, a ship with a completely different name. We also see some of Kirk's record for the years he lived following their encounter. He never commanded another starship, but he had a few more impressive-looking assignments for Starfleet before finally retiring. Riker finds that comforting. If Sulu found life beyond the Excelsior and Kirk found life after the Enterprise, then he and Picard and their crew will find life after their Enterprise as well. Picard chuckles, says, Something tells me the Enterprise isn't through with us just yet. The ship passes by a brilliant, beautiful nebula, and Picard and Riker walk over to the window to look at it. A stellar nursery, Riker says. He'd heard they'd be passing by on their way home. New stars being born. Picard raises his glass and makes a humble toast to new stars and new worlds. The Excelsior B or C or whatever sails off into the galaxy, credits, the end. The next movie, Star Trek First Contact, can happen just the way it did, with Picard and crew aboard their new Enterprise E. This version of Generations has no underwhelming and unnecessary death for Captain Kirk. It's an exciting crossover adventure involving both Enterprise crews, Sounds pretty good to me, assuming we could find satisfying ways of filling in the many, many, many blanks left open in my pitch, like, you know, the specific motivations and goals of the villain, and shape this bag of ideas I've just dumped out into a coherent and satisfying narrative, which, given enough time, I'm sure would be no problem. But remember, that's just option one. 
Option two is much more similar to the Star Trek Generations we actually got, but radically different in one very important respect. There's no Captain Kirk stuff at all. It's just a TNG movie. Let me lay out, generally speaking, how I think that might work. We lose the Enterprise B prologue completely and open with the gang on the Enterprise D. As I said earlier, I like the idea of the old sailing ship on the holodeck as a way of introducing our main characters, so I'd want to try to keep that, just, you know, do a better job with it. Instead of randomly distributing meaningless lines to the characters who aren't Picard, Data, or Riker, give each member of the ensemble a moment or two to let us know who they are. We'll get to know them all better as the film progresses, hopefully, but if we're going to bother to do a big scene like this with everyone present to introduce the characters to anyone watching who isn't already a rabid Trekkie, we ought to actually introduce all the characters. Maybe instead of shoving Crusher overboard, Data can shove Troy overboard. And Riker can help her back into the boat and make a joke like, shouldn't you have seen that coming? And Troy can say, I'm an empath, not a fortune teller. Besides, he's an android. Then Crusher can ask someone to fetch her a first aid kit so she can look over Troy and make sure she's okay. So we establish a relationship between Riker and Troy. We establish Troy's empathic abilities. We establish Data being an android without emotions. And we establish Crusher being the doctor. I know that might not seem like a big deal, especially if you're coming in as a fan of TNG who already knows who everyone is, but it definitely helps to establish who everyone is just on a basic level. And like I said, if you're going to do a scene like this with everyone there anyway, why not use it to properly introduce everybody? The scene still ends with Picard getting his mysterious bad news and things more or less proceed as they do in the actual film. Data still decides to take the plunge on his emotion ship. They still find Sauron on the observatory. His plan is the same, blow up stars to get back to the Nexus. There remains the plot hole of Sauron not just flying a ship into the Nexus, because even though it destroys ships, you end up in the Nexus anyway. If any of you can think of a good way to close that plot hole, please share your ideas in the comments. Otherwise, I'm not going to worry about it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And if the story is compelling, nobody but the nitpickers is going to notice and or care. Because we're losing the Kirk stuff, the Picard stuff has to come up and really become the emotional core of the movie. In Generations as it exists, all the Nexus stuff comes across as an elaborate contrivance to allow Kirk and Picard to meet and team up, and Picard's family tragedy plays as a subplot slapped on in a half-assed attempt to make the Nexus something other than a plot device. But in this version, Picard and the deaths of his brother and nephew and how his tragedy and his reaction to it paralyzes parallels that of Soren needs to be what the movie is ultimately about. That means Picard's visit to the Nexus needs to be substantially different from what we see in the existing version. Instead of a fantasy Christmas with an imaginary family, Picard needs to see his brother and his nephew. Just his brother and his nephew, and not dressed as characters in a Dickens novel, but as they actually were. He relives the last time he saw them, the last time the Enterprise returned to Earth, let's say six months ago. They're all together at Chateau Picard, sharing some food and wine. At first, Picard doesn't know what's happening, but the longer it goes on, the more he gives himself over to it and feels at home. Then Guinan shows up, same explanation as in the actual film. She's an echo of the Guinan he knows left behind from when she was in the Nexus. Oh, we'll keep that part of Soren's backstory. By the way, we just won't show it, and Kirk and the Enterprise B won't have anything to do with it. But this time, when Guinan explains how the Nexus works, she's not telling Picard that he can travel backwards and forwards through a fantasy life and spend time with his imaginary wife and children. She's telling him he can go back and relive every day with his brother and his nephew, or go forward and see the lives they would have had. And yes, that's a fantasy too, but it includes Picard's actual family, and it would take away the grief that still sits heavily on his chest, and, as Guinan tells him, it would be as real as he wants it to be. Picard knows this is false. Picard knows he should leave, go back, stop Soren, all that hero stuff. If he didn't know that, Guinan wouldn't be there telling it to him. 
But in this version, in order to do the hero stuff, he has to turn his back on a life with the family he lost. He does, of course. He's Captain Picard. He does the right thing. But it hurts. He makes the decision to leave, has a brief, restrained farewell moment with Robert and Rene, which is wrenching because we know Picard is dying underneath that stoic exterior, and leaves the Nexus to do what he has to do. Since there's no Captain Kirk for him to recruit for backup, Picard returns to face Soren alone to basically relive the few minutes before Soren launches his rocket and destroys the star. But now Picard knows where Soren is going to be and what he's going to do, so he uses that knowledge to outmaneuver him, and then, in a very Captain Picard way, he appeals to Soren on the basis of their shared grief and reaches out to the villain's humanity and talks him out of it. After the situation with Soren has been diffused, Picard gets a message from Riker on his communicator. He was on the planet during the fight between the Enterprise and the Bird of Prey, remember, so this is how he learns about the crash of the Enterprise. Riker calls him urgently, sounds relieved that Picard is okay, prompting Picard, with concern rising in his voice, to ask his first officer, what's happened? Then we cut to the crash site, where recovery operations are underway. We get a captain's log voiceover explaining that Dr. Sarin surrendered himself to Starfleet security and will stand trial for his crimes. And now, all that's left in the aftermath of the events of the last few days is to pick up the pieces and carry on. And from then, things can wrap up pretty much as they do in the existing film. Picard and Riker have their final scene in the ruins of the ready room and the bridge. They talk about the passage of time, the importance of cherishing moments that won't come again. They tease that this won't be the last ship named Enterprise. Beam up. Credits. See you later. There are other little tweaks and changes we can make along the way. Cutting out the Kirk stuff gives us a bit more breathing room as far as runtime, so it would be nice to give both Crusher and Troy something more substantial to do in the story. I'd also like to avoid the Geordi gets tortured scene, or at least give Geordi something else to do besides that so it doesn't feel like getting tortured and used as a pawn by the villain is his main contribution. And it'd be nice if there was a way to tie Data's emotion ship plot in a bit more closely with Picard's story, thematically speaking. I know in the actual version they have that scene together in stellar cartography. Maybe there's a way to build onto that a bit without making it feel too obvious or contrived. Just a thought. It's a movie, not an episode of a weekly TV series. I'd like it to feel as unified as possible. But that's the general idea. As with option number one, I'd love to read your suggestions for how to expand upon or improve my pitch for the Kirk-free version of Generations in the comments. Regardless of which of my alternate versions you prefer, or even if you think they both suck and you've got your own ideas, which is cool too, the most important lesson to take away from this frivolous exercise is this. If you're going to do something, do it. Don't do it halfway, don't do it in a manner that is so compromised and patched together that the end result hardly seems worth the work that went into it. Because that's what I see when I watch Star Trek Generations. It plays like the product of a group of people who wanted to do a TOS TNG crossover movie, but couldn't do that movie for a variety of reasons, so they lowered their ambitions and produced a watered-down version of the movie they wanted to make instead of just doing something else. And yeah, they probably had no choice. The studio didn't want to pay for a proper crossover movie, but they still wanted a crossover movie, and the producers did the best they could under the circumstances to deliver one, but the lesson for us remains the same. Life is full of compromises, and sometimes, frequently in fact, compromise is a good thing, but when it comes to things that bear your mark, that express your ideas, that tell your story, don't compromise the quality of that finished product unless it's out of your hands and you have no other choice, and hopefully you don't find yourself in that situation very often. Star Trek Generations could have been the high point of Star Trek's mid-1990s creative renaissance, the logical climax of a decade that saw big-screen success for the original cast and small-screen success for the next generation, the spanning of two generations that fans had dreamed about for years, the meeting of Captain Kirk and Captain Picard. It could have been that. It might have been that. It should have been that. Instead, 
It's just a lousy Star Trek movie. Underwhelming and inconsequential. It is what it is because the people who made it were forced to settle. Don't settle if you can help it. Life's too short and your time is too precious. Don't settle. Demand better for yourself and your work, whatever it is. Don't be someone who puts your name on something you know doesn't represent what you can really do or who accepts less than you know you're really worth. Be like Shane Douglas when he refused the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in favor of becoming the franchise of ECW, an event which took place in August of 1994. See? Not a bad year after all. If you liked ECW, I was never a fan. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Epic Phil. Thanks, Epic Phil. Jake Brabeck. Thanks, Jake. David. Thanks, David. Jamil Moladina. Thanks, Jamil. Barry Klein. Thanks, Barry. Simon Hurek, thanks Simon. Tavana Stromsing Bakken, thanks Tavana. Daryl Sisson, thanks Daryl. Best Stressed, thanks Best Stressed. And now for the new channel members. They are Wild Weasels, thanks Wild Weasels. Brian Shepard, thanks Brian. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather make a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic. This month, we talked about a Star Trek movie that was a failure creatively and commercially. But for next month, you, my patrons and members who took part in the most recent poll, have chosen as a topic another Star Trek movie that is the opposite of Star Trek Generations. It's a movie that was a great success creatively and commercially. In fact, in terms of domestic box office gross, it was the most successful film in the franchise until the 2009 Star Trek. So we're going to talk about why this particular film was and is so popular and beloved next month in a video dedicated to answering the question, why was Star Trek IV The Voyage Home actually so successful? That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.